So for this video, we're going to look into how um, the ocean depths were measured. So it's coming off the heels of these um, ideas for continental drift, which have very specific predictions about what's on the ocean floor. And so um, the revolution of bathymetric technologies are really a way to investigate you know, how the continents could be splitting apart if they were at all. So in this video, we're going to outline um, how we know the structure of the ocean floor and the different techniques that came along the way um, to measure the ocean depths and the advantages and disadvantages of these methods. Today, you know, most of the global ocean maps of ocean bathymetry that you'll see are ingesting a lot of data from satellites from space. And so we will talk about you know, how, these, how the satellites are actually measuring ocean depth because it's, um, it's not as straightforward as it is for land. So one of the first technologies to measure you know, the depth of a water column anywhere is, uh, is what's called a, a sounding pole. This is just a big stick with some markings on it so you know how much um, of that stick is below the water uh, and at, at the water line. So this is pretty intuitive technology. You can probably imagine using it without any real training. Um, but this only gets you, you know, maybe 20 feet, 30 feet or so, and then it's, you're, you're dealing with a really you know, big stick at that point. And, and you're not really able to go offshore in any real capacity. So one of the first measurements of the, the deep ocean was in the Mediterranean using something that's called a sounding line. So a sounding line is uh, essentially a, uh, a long string of rope with a weight at the end. And then uh, you basically lower that down and wait to feel the ocean bottom um, and basically measure how much line has been put out there. Um, and so that has been the way that you know, ocean depths have been measured for a long period of time um, and you know, up until the 1870s. So the first, I would say, global experiment or mission to measure the, the ocean depths was the HMS Challenger expedition in the 1870s. This was still using this uh, sounding line uh, method. You know, the thing that really sucks about this is that you have to pull it back up. So if you're a part of the ocean that's 4,000 meters deep, you're pulling in you know, miles of, of rope at this point. Um, fortunately for the crew on the Challenger, they had a steam powered um, winches to sort of pull the line in, but it still takes a long time. And even then you only have one single measurement from where you are, it takes hours to do. So this is not a really effective way to map the oceans. Um, but you can still learn a lot just from doing this over and over and over again. So this is sort of the first, um, you know, measurement or map of, uh, of the North Atlantic from this I, from this sounding line method, um, you can see the the different bathymetries that you can you know observe this, and you can see each individual point. There's not that many you know, measurements of the ocean floor at the you know, turn of the 20th century. So, but what you can see here this is areas of shallower topography coming down here. This is the first evidence of the the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Um, here, followed by you know this connected by these deeper bits of ocean down here, but you're not really getting much resolution compared to what we'll see later on. So it's hard enough to do this you know hundreds of times, much less thousands, much less tens of thousands. So this is a real uh, bottleneck in terms of how we can understand the the deep ocean because there's has to be a lot of sounding lines going out. It would take a long time, and it's not a very efficient way to map the ocean floor. Fortunately, a new technology emerged in the you know, 1910s, 1920s um, that uh, unlocks this technique of, of echo sounding. So this was an idea that was really born out of the Titanic disaster in 1912. Uh, I think you know some version of the story. The Titanic is the biggest ship ever built. It hits an iceberg, it sinks, uh, thousands die, and it's a huge disaster. And so this led to the development of what's called an iceberg detector and echo depth sounder. So the idea was that you can use uh, essentially sonar techniques, a sound pulse that um, will tell you if you have an iceberg in front of you, even if it's nighttime. Um, and you can also see how deep the water is by setting this, the sound down instead of out. Um, so what this does is, you, is a, this machine creates a sound pulse and then it waits, uh, you know, if you're looking for icebergs, you're sort of pushing this out in front of the ship uh, or downward if you're trying to figure out depth. And then that sound is coming down to the bottom of the ocean. It's hitting the seafloor, and it's bouncing back up. And you should hear an echo. So this is how you might turn this into an actual depth. 
there's usually, usually some gap in time between the original ping from the sounder and then the receiver hearing the echo. This rests on knowing the speed of sound in water, which is around 1.5 kilometers per second. So if, you know, let's say you do this experiment, you have this echo sounder, you send off a ping, and then four seconds later, you hear the, you know, the receiver picks up the echo. Well, how deep is the water that you're under? And so the way, the, the way to do this is by taking that 1.5 kilometers uh, per second, you know, multiplying that by the four seconds, that you're, you waited to hear your echo, and then now you've got six kilometers depth. But you know it's important to realize that the sound is going from the ship down to the ocean bottom and then back up. So it's traveling two ocean depths in that case. So the actual depth is uh, six kilometers divided by two, or three kilometers. So uh, echo sounding became a really easy um, and relatively inexpensive way to know depths ships have a vested interest in knowing depth because you don't want to run aground on shallow reefs or harbors you're not familiar with. So this is a technology that was widely deployed and uh, became a way to, to generate not just you know, hundreds, not just thousands, but hundreds of thousands of data points for, for measuring the ocean depths. Um, this led to the development of the first comprehensive charts of the ocean floor by 1959. Um, but there's, there's some issues here, right? I mean, it's this, the sound beam as it goes down in the water is spreading out a little bit. So you're, you're not getting you know, a single point on the ocean floor, you're getting some average of, of what's, what's beneath you here. And so if you're on some kind of flat seabed, it's not a problem because everything is pretty close to the same depth. But let's say you have some kind of a trench or some kind of a seamount or other kind of local topography that has you know, sharper features. You're, what you're gonna see is some kind of you know, average here. Some of the sound is gonna come back sooner, some of it is gonna come back later. Um, and so you're not going to be able to capture that, that gradient in the seafloor that you might be trying to do in order to understand, oh, is this a seamount, is this a plateau, um, what's going on here? But still you can get a lot of cool data from this. So these are the first uh, echo sounding transects from the North Atlantic here. These, are, um, these were done in the 1950s, uh, specifically for the purposes of mapping the mid-ocean ridges. And what you can see here, these are, this is uh, the transects here across, you can see the various points um, through the, the tropical North Atlantic into the, the northern North Atlantic. And this is, you know, one of the first ways to see the mid-ocean ridges in like in real detail, right? So you can see the continental shelf, North America here. You can see some islands or seamounts over here. And then this mid-ocean ridge coming together, some taller plateaus, and then the coast of Africa here. And this mid-ocean ridge is a consistent feature in all of these, and you can see the different spikes um, and the resolution there. So this is a real game changer in, in terms of visualizing the open ocean. So obviously those are you know, continuous transects, and so one of the really amazing uh, you know, works was to, was to sort of put this into a you know, full two-dimensional color space. And this does require a good deal of interpolation, right? I mean, if you remember before you had a couple side swipes here, you have you know, a little bit of other data too to, to throw into the mix, but you're not having um, Know, the, the same density you'd want or that we're, uh, we expect today. So this is work that was done by Bruce Heason and Marie Tharp. Um, Marie Tharp is sort of a really inspirational case because this is you know, work being done in the 1950s and 1960s. Women were not allowed on research vessels because they were considered to be you know, bad luck. It was this institutional sexism that fortunately has gone away, but still leaves a bit of a legacy for anyone who's, who's done any work at sea. Um, Despite the fact that she couldn't actually go out to sea to make these measurements, uh, she was you know, central in compiling these images of the ocean floor that really changed the way that people saw the Earth. Uh, it's a really remarkable contribution sort of in the face of adversity. But what you can see from this is you, know, you can see the mid-ocean ridge here. And not only that, you can see the cent central rift valley in the center here. This is a, a drop in topography. So you have the mid-ocean ridge, which is overall higher than the abyssal plains, and then a drop in the center. You can see that detail here. You can see these fracture zones across here. Uh, you can see all the seamounts here. This is near the Bermuda area. You can see uh, seamounts in the Canaries and the Azores. Um, so this is sort of a, you know, a remarkable unveiling of the deep ocean in a way that no one had ever seen before. So where do we go from here? You know, the problem with uh, you know, echo sounding is that you have this, this, the sound as it fans out, you have basically sort of an average of what's below. The solution to this, it turns out, is to just have several different echo sounders all sort of working together in concert 
And then you have this sort of array of different echo sound probes. So you have a sound coming out here, being received, sound coming out here, being received, sound coming out here, being received. And this is a way to untangle complex uh, deep ocean topography. And you can see, you know, really small scale features in really stunning definition here. Uh, this is mostly on research ships and military vessels. And so if, if the deep ocean is being mapping here, for instance, if you want to um, you know, map some underwater volcano or a sunken shipwreck, what you can do is you can sort of do this mowing the lawn pattern here where you have a certain uh, width of observation. You can go across here, turn back, go across here, and then you can start filling in larger paths uh, through these different swaths. Um, so this is an example from the East Pacific Rise. This is uh, sort of close to the southern tip of uh, Baja, California. And this is with this multi, multi-sounding beam. Um, and you can see here, these are the sort of mon, lawn mowing tracks. And you can see that there's, again, all this sort of stunning apography. This is, these are called the abyssal hills here. These evenly spaced, uh, you know, rises in topography. You can see volcanoes. There's a whole lot of stuff you can see here that would be really hard to, to you know, see for sure in a single beam. And this, this picture over here is sort of meant to represent that. This here is what the, the depths you might see in a single beam versus a multi-beam. You have all this complexity that you're now able to, to look at and interpret. So um, this is a multi-beam composite for uh, the Hawaiian Islands. You know, fortunately, all the research ships that are launched out of the University of Hawaii have these multi-beam technologies. And so we've been able to get really high resolution views of the Hawaiian archipelago um, and the sort of seamounts surrounding it. So this is kind of stunning to, to, to look at. I'll just leave it up here for a few seconds. Um, one of the, my favorite thing about this are these, uh, what are called slides here, where uh, you know, sometime in the past there were these catastrophic collapses of several different of the islands. Um, and you can see these submarine landslides leaving debris fields that are you know, hundreds of miles away. These are huge events. They must have triggered giant tsunamis in the past. And you can see the evidence here on the seafloor. But it would be hard to see this if you didn't have this really high accuracy um, multi-beam technology. OK, so multi-beam technology is still used today. This is one of the most popular ways to get really high resolution um, views of the seafloor for specific projects or specific areas. How do we get a global picture? Well, the first, was, uh, the first global picture came out of the echo sounding technique. But like we said, there's some approximations. There's, we don't have global coverage in all cases, so there's some guesswork to fill in the gaps. What's happened more recently is that satellites have been able to fill in these missing pieces of the ocean much more effectively. So how does this work? I mean, um, you know, satellites are looking down. They can't see the ocean floor, so this has to be figured out indirectly. What, what's going on here is the satellite can, can measure small differences in the sea surface. And you might think, well, those, those are just waves, right? Um, you know, the, the sea surface changes because ocean currents or from you know, waves that break. But you know, actually, there's a very small distortion in the height of the ocean due to the gravitational pull of the things underneath it. So for instance, if you have an ocean ridge here, um, that's going to pull some of the water sort of closer um, to the ridge. And it's going to create a small bump in um, the ocean topography here. This is on the scale of a few centimeters or so. So this is not you know, massive. It would be really hard to notice if you're just looking out. And so in order for these satellites to work, they need to take you know, several different measurements to average out the effect of you know, waves, of currents, of anything else that can distort the sea surface. So the only thing left is the, the topography leading to this gravitational piling up of the water column here to just a level of a few centimeters. So it's really amazing that this works, but it, it really does. And so this is what these uh, sea surface anomalies, essentially these gravitational anomalies, look like on a basin scale. This is over the Indian Ocean. You can see there's uh, ocean island chains that are showing up here in red. These are areas of enhanced gravity because there's just more you know, crust. There's, there's mountains underneath the water here that are showing up here. You can see also the ridges in really you know, nice detail. This is a highly accurate technique. Um, you can also see the impact of trenches right through Indonesia. These are sort of negative gravitational anomalies because you're sort of missing ocean crust here that would be you know, acting to uh, missing gravity here. So the ocean crust, the ocean sea level will be a little bit lower here. Same thing for the Philippines trench as well. And so this has been a, you know, a real game changer because it takes a lot of the guesswork out of this. Um, 
obviously it requires lots of satellite passes in order to average out these you know things like weather and, and other things like that but you can see how this really transforms our view of for instance what the indian ocean looks like this is uh the view from the echo soundings it didn't have a whole lot of coverage in this basin and this is the view today so you can see these features are much finer here certain ones are more prominent like this hotspot track here of ocean islands but you can see the, the mid-ocean ridges here look a lot more dramatic in um, these more artistic representations than they do in actuality. You can see, this is the track of the mid-ocean ridges in, in the satellite version. So this is a more accurate version today. This is sort of what's used scientifically today, even though you know, personally I think these maps are, are quite beautiful. So um, you know, looking through all the information that we've gone through here, you know, how do we know how deep the ocean is? This started off with very simple techniques where you just had you know a weight and a rope and you just kept lowering that rope until you hit the bottom um, very simple but very time and labor intensive this is replaced by echo sounding which is able to scale and be put on lots of different ships um, it's simple you know in terms of its technology but it um, it has some limit to its precision so this is how we first saw the deep ocean on a global scale for the first time but you know this technique has been phased out by by multi-beam technologies, if you want to you know, dig really deep into certain structures uh, at mid-ocean ridges or ocean volcanoes or ocean trenches. And then if you want a global scale picture, satellite altimetry has, has been used to fill in the gaps here. So when you're reviewing this material, uh, it's good to outline you know, what technological developments were really key to unfolding the structure of the seafloor, and then know the advantages and dis disadvantages of the methods we've talked about here. Lastly, uh, this, because the satellite technique is so important to our current maps of the ocean floor, it's good to know how ocean depth is measured from space actually through these gravitational anomalies.